Okay, this is Robert Gish, ready to start the presentation today on evaluation of the patient with cirrhosis and subsequent medical management. There are at least 3 million people in the U.S. who have cirrhosis today, and the number dying cirrhosis may be as high as 60,000 60, people per year. Over 50% of people with cirrhosis don't know they have the disease. And a recent VA study showed 80% of the veterans that had cirrhosis did not know had they had cirrhosis and did not have that diagnosis in the chart. It's in the top 10 leading causes of death in the US. Hepatitis C was leading the pack. It's been replaced by alcohol and fatty liver. So hepatitis C is moving to three and probably move to four pretty soon as we treat more and cure more people. This just talks about the shift that's taking place, but what you're seeing here <clears throat> is a shift towards fatty liver over the last two decades. And I believe this is or will be the leading cause for a mixture of alcohol, NASH, alcohol plus NASH, this is a picture of a patient with cirrhosis, time of a liver transplant. Cirrhosis is reversible, but it's usually early cirrhosis, early stage four disease that reversibility can take place with alcohol abstinence or reversing fatty liver, curing C, suppressing B. Look at the number of people with cirrhosis in the US. I think the number is actually higher than this if you continue the underestimation calculation. Chronic liver disease is over 80 million. Think about how much fatty liver there is in this country. So we always start out by taking a history and doing a physical exam and looking at laboratory tests and looking at imaging. On physical, I start doing a physical as soon as the patient walks into the room. I look at their face, I look at their muscle, I look at their hands, I you know, take a look at their ankles. How, how's their eye movement? Are they jaundice, muscle wasting, spiders? Um, that is a physical exam. Getting from a chair up onto an exam table back into a chair is part of my very active physical exam. I do like to look at liver function. Billy Rubin's the best liver function test. Remember AST and ALT are not liver function tests. They are liver enzymes. Platelet count gives you an indirect assessment of portal hypertension. And in our patients, we look at AST to ALT ratio, APRI, FIB4, transient elastography. Imaging studies are gonna tell you what does the liver look like? Is the edge of the liver scalloped, irregular? Is the left lobe big? Is the right lobe small? We measure the spleen size. We measure the portal vein diameter. We look for ascites. And of course, endoscopy helps us by assessing for esophageal or gastric varices and the possible presence of gastropathy. This just goes back to platelet count. My magic number is if the platelet counts under 160,000, they have F3, advanced fibrosis. If it's under 100,000, <coughs> they're cirrhotic. So the platelet count's quite useful, but if they look at across 100 cirrhotic patients, 15% or so have platelet counts over 150,000, sometimes over 200,000. And that usually leads me to think about other diagnoses, including bone marrow disorders. Liver biopsy is no longer necessary to diagnose cirrhosis. And in fact, I rarely biopsy patients unless I'm looking for something that's treatable. You've got varices or cirrhosis for at least portal hypertension. There's a big spleen with portal hypertension, probably due to cirrhosis. Ultrasound, CT, and MR, of course, can help us stage these patients making a good medical history, risk factors, uh, symptoms, sleep disorder, mental confusion, memory, are all quite useful. Liver biopsy, the reason we don't do it, it's much less than perfect. It measures 1 50,000th of the liver. And cirrhosis can be missed, especially because a lot of the local radiologists were using 18 and 19 gauge needles because they thought they were safer. You need a 16 gauge needle, at least two centimeters of tissue, preferably 20 portal areas to really get a full assessment of liver structure. <clears throat> now, the signs of cirrhosis like variceal bleeding, encephalopathy, ascites, how much ascites? Is it 
diuretic refractory or resistant. SBP, hepatorenal syndrome, all reflect on that short-term survival prediction for that patient. Short-term and intermediate term, so if you have the five years, you're looking at different survival probabilities. So this is a really nice curve because you look up at the top, it goes, oh, the platelet count's a little bit low. Hmm, there's a problem. Bilirubin, INR, and albumin start changing. Much bigger problem. Ascites, refractory ascites, elevated creatinine, low sodium. You're on a really incredible curve towards a high probability of death. Along the bottom is the Ishek score. Instead of four stages, this has six stages in it. But the fourth, fifth, and sixth stages are it's really split up from stage four uh, from the uh, typical biopsy or staging system that we use. So stage four is cirrhosis in general. In this system, it's five and six. So if a person <clears throat> is compensated, a chance of being decompensated in five years is 50%. By the time you're out to 12 years, it's heading towards 75%. Not all patients with cirrhosis will progress especially if there's alcohol intervention, NASH intervention, hepatitis C cure, hepatitis B control. What do we do? Why does somebody have it? We're gonna screen for varices and decide on surveillance. Oh, the later the stage of the cirrhosis, the higher the chance of varices. And you can see here that 50% of people with child C cirrhosis don't have varices because they typically have decompressed through other portal venous collaterals. This is what varices look like on the right. These are medium really on the right side. Large is when they're just protruding out and really touching each other. Small varices you can see, of course, and then left is a normal esophagus. But once people have varices, you don't treat the underlying disease, this will, these will progress. So we have different types of varices. You've got pure esophageal, esophageal gastric, pure gastric. Once you get into the pure gastric type, you have a much higher chance of death and rebleeding. Gastric varices are much worse. We typically, <clears throat> those patients are going to be early to put in a tip shot. So the word screening is the first test. Surveillance is ongoing testing. Surveillance endoscopy or surveillance ultrasound. Surveillance endoscopy for varices. Surveillance ultrasound for liver cancer. And this just describes no small, medium, or large and what we do to follow. All right, liver cancer surveillance. Standard of care is every six months. Ultrasound plus triple liver cancer biomarker panel. So this goes back to being a 17 year old cohort compensated what happens to those patients, how many events occur per year. So if you have an annual rate of 4%, you've got a 17 year follow-up, definitely around 60% of those patients are dead. 4% liver cancer, you're going up to 17 years. This is a little bit high in my opinion, <clears throat> but you're up in the 60% range. Same thing as ascites and jaundice, some smaller multiple GI bleeding and encephalopathy. All right, key issue. Is what, is these, what are these patients? What is this patient in front of you? What's their nutritional status? It's not just nutrition, it has to do with frailty, sarcopenia, muscle strength. And that's again, part of my physical exam. I look at the person walk in the room, walk from the chair to the exam table, get up on the exam table without help is my preference. Get down without help, help. I'm not being not helpful. I'm using this as part of my physical exam. How much muscle wasting is there? We can assess that quickly on physical. And that muscle wasting also is part of the encephalopathy story because muscle is important in urea cycling and processing ammonia and other toxins that are involved. As you know, ammonia is not the only bad actor, it's one of many bad actors in encephalopathy. Muscles, when they're full, help detoxify things. When the muscles are gone, it's terrible. 
And the muscle wasting also occurs because of chronic hypoglycemia. So our cirrhotics should be instructed in clinic about this diet. Our nutrition team should describe the diet. Seven snacks per day, high carb, high protein, low fat. That's the cirrhosis diet. Look how much these bones are sticking out of the skin. So what results in just decreased muscle mass. So active alcohol, poor protein intake, uh, poverty, social support, just bad diet in general. As I mentioned, the liver is involved in gluconeogenesis. You don't have enough glucose. The muscle starts its own hypermetabolism, metabolism, digesting itself. Hormone deficiencies can work to make this worse. Also, ascites in and of itself changes the body's metabolism. It's a very strange fact. And it's just the presence of ascites alone makes people quite catabolic. And they're catabolic, they're digesting muscle, uh, and, you know, making gluconeogenesis or moving to other types of uh, nutrition uh, energy storage. So total body protein goes down, down, down. Albumin goes down. Muscle wasting takes place. This is all being done by different types of imaging. Muscle wasting and mortality. Let's see if I can get this bill to come up. Once you have sarcopenia, 2.2 fold increased risk of death. More predictive of death than meld and child pew. So, why don't we do it more often? Uh, test for sarcopenia more often, especially with training and education. Sarcopenia, this can be assessed on MR and CT. How big are the psoas muscles? Is there under all that fat in the um, gluteal region? Is there marked muscle changes or minimal muscle changes? So this not only predicts death before transplant or predicts death in general, but predicts the chance of dying after liver transplant. So if you have a poor functional status before transplant, this is by one through five on the left, the chance of mortality goes up from 5.3, the number would quote typically, to 25%. So physical therapy, walking three hours a week with weightlifting, stretching uh, are all, I think, key part of this. Things. All of our cirrhotic patients should be getting DEXA scans, not just the women, but the men. And the men, if they have abnormal bones, should be getting testosterone level. And if testosterone deficient, testosterone should be supplemented. At least 1,000 calories of calcium per day with supplements, vitamin D level 40 to 50, and overall improvements in nutritional status is key. Other problems that amplify osteoporosis and liver disease including alcohol and smoking. Uh, decreased sunlight results in vitamin D dismetabolism. Gonads, we're gonna be definitely in men be checking for testosterone levels if we're suspicious. And steroids can help some patients due to relative adrenal insufficiency. Vitamin K, vitamin D, zinc, vitamin A, we're assessing for all of these vitamins and nutrient deficiencies in all of our cirrhotics. Treatment of osteoporosis is difficult, but boosting vitamin D, boosting calcium intake is absolutely essential. Physical exercise also increases bone health. Other lifestyle changes, of course, have to do with managing fatty liver disease aggressively. Um, weight loss with cirrhosis can take place if there's increased activity and they're burning fat weight, not muscle weight. No. So when a person has liver disease of any cause, including NASH, the more obese they are, the higher the chance of decompensating. So even in our cirrhotic patients, one of whom we had today, we're saying, yeah, you have cirrhosis, but start your calorie restriction, start your you know, exercise status, um, diet management. Moving now to liver cancer. We're doing liver cancer surveillance every six months in all of our patients. Men tend to have about three times the risk of liver cancer than women. We don't know exactly why, but it may be hormone related. Testosterone can be driving different types of cancer development. 
That's why in a cirrhotic who's testosterone deficient, we have to be careful about administering testosterone due to those risk for cancer, liver cancer. Surveillance is easy. Every six months, and my modification on this is the triple liver cancer biomarker panel. Okay, <clears throat> so you got a small one, less than one centimeter tumor, let's say it's 0.8 centimeters. You can do repeat imaging with whatever you think best quality is in three months. And over three and six months, you're gonna reassess growth or no growth, and then decide how you're going to you know, manage that patient. Once it's over one centimeter, you're gonna move right to a multi-phase MR, in my opinion. Um, and try to avoid CT due to radiation and the contrast. Biopsy is rarely needed for liver masses because we now use what's called LIRADS, liver imaging reporting and data systems. Characteristics on LIRADS will decide if it's cancer or not to extremely high probability without the danger of a biopsy. So this has to do with BMI. So there's something driving uh, cirrhosis in men over women. Uh, and then the, again, maybe hormone related. But the death rate in men is much higher than women, but we think this is linked to the intermediate step of actually getting cirrhosis. Uh, this is diabetes. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why I don't like insulin. And when people have diabetes, they're either on insulin or they are hyperinsulinemic. Insulin drives risk for liver cancer and multiple other cancers as well. Insulin should be used only for type 1 diabetics in a controlled setting. Surveillance, like we do here, ultrasound and triple liver cancer biomarker panel. <clears throat> Every six months, we move to MR preferred over CT. If the biomarker, biomarker counts, indexes are going up, we just stay with ultrasound if the biomarkers are negative or normal. Uh -oh, hang on a second. Who's <clears> done? <throat> I need it to do a lot. I just tested it out today. Oh, adequate. All right, here we go. Alcohol use is bad for many, many reasons. And it Disease worse, liver disease worse, liver cancer risk higher, nutrition, sarcopenia, frailty, encephalopathy. We tell everybody to stop smoking cigarettes. We try to have people stop cannabis, although it's much less strict than it used to be, especially now it's decriminalized or legalized. Coffee is extremely good. Up to three cups per day has anti fibrotic, anti cancer, anti inflammatory effects. We do advise coffee and tea. Tea has the same benefit. All right, what else can you do? Make sure the patient me, is not taking non steroidals. People have encephalopathy, you're extremely cautious about sleeping medications and narcotics. Aminoglycosides are never used, but if you give aminoglycosides to somebody with cirrhosis, especially if they have any renal complications, I mean, the glycosides are terrible. You have to watch herbal, um, duloxetine also may have some rare liver toxicity. Sedimentin is perfectly safe, up to two grams per day. Tramadol also safe, you wanna keep it under 150 per day. I think Benadryl for sleep is terrible. Trazodone, I think it's excellent. Melatonin, Doxepin, uh, really some of my favorites for sleep. You really wanna work on fixing sleep disorder. The more active the patient is during the day, the less likely they are to sleep and nap during the day, the more likely to sleep better at night. We check all of our patients for hepatitis A and B immunity. If there is a plan for splenectomy, we recommend pneumococcus meningococcal H flu. Of course, right now, pneumococcal vaccine has specific uh, recommendations for age-related vaccination. 
we try to give pneumococcal vaccine early in the management of cirrhotic patients. Annual influenza vaccine, strongly recommended pneumococcal, you mentioned, of course, SARS uh, called two COVID 19 vaccine, highly recommended in cirrhotics. It's already saved thousands of people's lives. Statins decrease portal hypertension, decrease inflammation, decrease fibrosis, decrease liver cancer risk. So I start everybody out on a statin well before I'm talking about beta blockers or carvedilol. Refer for liver transplant after you do a CTP score and a MELD score. The MELD's over 15, the CPT score is over B7, then you would refer them for a transplant. So you need to memorize this table of where to go to get the Mayo risk calculator, figure out where that person is. Um, we usually like to say we're going to put somebody on a list if they have a higher than 10% chance of dying in, in the, the next 10, sorry, the next year, and then bring those patients to evaluation. MELD score <clears throat> was a major advantage over ascites encephalopathy, bilirubin, INR, and albumin, especially since encephalopathy was so subjective. You could give somebody three points just automatically by saying, oh, you forgot where your car keys were. You're clearly encephalopathic. The MELD score now has been modified from creatinine, bilirubin, and INR to sodium MELD. That has actually helped change uh, our prediction. So, there's a MELD score and mortality. It's right around 15 is when we say someone needs to be on the list for liver transplant because that's where that mortality shift changes. MELD sodium is very important, especially for patients with lower MELD scores. If you have a MELD score between 15 and 25, the sodium effect is much greater than if you have a high MELD score, which is often driven by creatinine or other things. But sodium MELD is useful. So in conclusion, we've got a patient with cirrhosis. Lots of things to think about. When are we gonna do the first endoscopy? How are we gonna do liver cancer surveillance? I want a full nutritional workup. I want them to see the nutritionist to get five to six meals per day, high protein, high carbohydrate. No alcohol, no tobacco, no drugs, I think are very, very important. Treat uh, metabolic syndrome modestly aggressive meaning get people to lose about a pound a week is very, very useful. I put everybody on statins with cirrhosis for their anti-cancer effect, more likely for their anti-portal hypertension effect, which may obviate the need for using um, statins in the year for part of those patients. Now, statins have about a one in 80,000 chance of hurting the liver, causing acute liver injury. Statins have a high chance of helping people. We give statins and their varices are stable and small. I don't add a beta blocker. Patients should be seen once they have cirrhosis, compensated cirrhosis every three months for labs and symptom check. Six month cycle is reasonable to see a hepatologist um, and things can get reset. They stop drinking, it resets. Their hepatitis B is fully suppressed, it resets. 